There are some new images and details for Oppenheimer thanks to a newly published article by Total Film Magazine here in the UK. We primarily get interviews with Christopher Nolan and his extended cast where he reveals the runtime of the film, details on Killian Murphy's performance, the main differences between the black and white and colour sequences and how they were able to recreate the Trinity test using no CGI. In this video I'm going to be discussing the images and details shared, breaking down the newest info from the film. Before I get into it though, if you want to keep up to date on any of my content surrounding Christopher Nolan's Oppenheimer, then don't forget to support this upload by giving it a like rating, subscribing to the channel, and turning on your notifications. But without further ado, let's discuss the new images and details for Oppenheimer from Total Film. So the road to Oppenheimer has well and truly begun and the new edition of Total Film Magazine has provided us with a lot of new images and interviews for the highly anticipated film. The new article features two covers, one standard and one subscriber version, alongside multiple images and details from interviews with director Christopher Nolan, lead actor Killian Murphy, Emily Blunt, Josh Harnett and visual effects supervisors. The images in include Killian Murphy's Oppenheimer surveying the location of his built atom bomb, an exclusive look at Murphy and Matt Damon's Leslie Groves, a young Oppenheimer, Emily Blunt's Catherine, Josh Harnett's Ernest Lawrence, Florence Pugh's Jean Tatlock, Robert Downey Jr.'s Louis Strauss during Oppenheimer's hearings, and multiple behind-the-scenes shots from the film's production, including one of Nolan working with regular cinematographer Hoyt Van Hoytema. I will show these images images on screen again as I get into all the details shared, so speaking of that, let's dive into those mentioned interviews. So at the start of this new article, Total Film details what they saw and what Nolan said to them while they were watching him and his team put a sound mix together from a moment in the film. They talk about how the stage that they were mixing the sound at was one that both Nolan and his producing partner Emma Thomas has worked at since 2006's The Prestige and that they and editor Jennifer Lame were working on precise soundtrack tweaks during the showcase of stunning footage. They say that the footage included a black and white trial scene in which Robert Downey Jr.'s Louis Strauss asks questions about an FBI file on Oppenheimer himself. Total Film said that the scene cut back to a young Oppenheimer at Berkeley University, showing the time-hopping narrative that was once again going to be on display in a Nolan film. They said that the sound design rumbled and shook the room, outlining both the precise detail and large cinematic experience that this film is aiming to put on screen. So right from the get-go, in this new article, we learn that Oppenheimer is confirmed to have time jumps and that, like I and others predicted before, the black and white and colour will be intercut throughout the film. It's something that reminds us of Nolan's earlier work on Memento and how both of those different sequences involved were subjective and objective sides to that narrative. And in the article, Nolan does finally confirm what both of those intercutting sequences throughout the film will include. In my video the other week, I predicted that the court scenes in black and white would be the subjective part of the narrative and that the development of the bomb in colour would be the objective side. But it turns out that Nolan is actually doing a reverse of that in Oppenheimer and I must admit, once I think about it a bit more, it actually makes a lot of sense. Nolan said, I wrote the script in the first person, which I'd never done before. I don't know if anyone has ever done that or if it's a thing that people do or not, the film is objective and subjective. The colour scenes are subjective, the black and white scenes are objective. I wrote the colour scenes from the first person, so for an actor reading that, in some ways, I think it'd be quite daunting. So Nolan has essentially confirmed the narrative structure that we've all been theorising over for quite some time, and like I said before, it definitely reminds me of his work on Memento and how he told that complex 
Jackson psychological story of a man suffering from short-term memory loss in both of those sequences. It seems like Oppenheimer is going to cut back and forth between subjective colour scenes that showcase the development of the bomb with objective black and white moments that show the humiliation of Oppenheimer in court as they investigate whether he was feeding information to the Soviet Union. And as Total Film says, this is all to highlight the extreme contradictions that permeate Oppenheimer's life and work, and it's an effort to stay truthful to the source material in Kai Bird and Martin Sherwin's American Prometheus. Moving on, Nolan starts to share a few more details surrounding both the runtime of the film and his extended thoughts on Killian Murphy's lead performance. On the runtime, the director said, It's slightly longer than the longest we've done, it's kissing three hours. This means that Oppenheimer is Nolan's longest film and it beats Interstellar's running time of 2 hours and 49 minutes. When it comes to the character and Killian's performance, he added, I'm drawn to interesting protagonists, protagonists who have ambiguity to them. I think of any character I've dealt with, and Oppenheimer is by far the most ambiguous and paradoxical, which given that I've made three Batman films is saying a lot. There are no easy answers to any aspect of this story. I think, in a way, he's the extreme type of protagonist I've been interested in over the years. In truth, there are just not that many actors that you could say on a first-person approach, yeah, we're going to be this guy for three hours. You're making a demand of an actor that very few actors in the history of film can rise to. I will say that even with that confidence in him, he was continually surprising me on set every day. And when we got into the edit suite and were putting the performance together and seeing the truth of it, I was absolutely blown away. When it came to the specifics of Murphy's performance and how he would transmit the situations that appear in broad strokes in the source material, Nolan then said that it was a hell of a task for the actor to really convey that character fully. The director said, he's playing a massive massive part of the guy's life and that presents challenges. Yes, there are physical challenges with that, but more than that, the psychological challenge is trying to absorb an entire life experience of somebody else. Not just a moment in time, but whole periods of his life and to show that to the audience to fill that with him. It's a big challenge I've set him, but he stepped up far beyond what I would have imagined was possible, just taking you into his head and his experience. So after Nolan gave his thoughts on certain aspects of the film and specifically Killian Murphy's performance, it was then time to hear from the actors towards their performances and the film as a whole. Killian Murphy admitted to Total Film that he had only a surface awareness of J. Robert Oppenheimer before agreeing to take on the role. He said, I think I had kind of a Wikipedia level knowledge of Oppenheimer like most people do, so then it was, well, it was just starting from scratch really. Chris guided me through that, you can only do it one bite at a time, you have to go slowly. And thankfully, we had time. On the performance itself, he said, it was very helpful to me to find that silhouette, to be able to embrace the iconography of him, which was the hat and the pipe, and certainly the cut of his suits, and to try to find a physical shape that would make that as iconic as he was in real life. Because he was very conscious about that. It wasn't by accident, he chose that look for himself. And on the genre of the film, he explained, there are elements of thriller in it, and it has that epic quality. Emily Blunt, who plays Oppenheimer's wife, echoed similar thoughts, but also talked a bit more about the complex nature of her character in the midst of speaking about Killian. She said, the script was so emotional, and it reads like a thriller. It's almost like Nolan has Trojan horsed a biopic into a thriller. It's really pulse racing, the whole thing. I was just completely arrested by the story, the portrait of this man, and I guess the trauma of a brain like that. On her character, she mentioned, Kitty is a very big personality, not necessarily one to conform to a housewife ideal of the time. For anyone who knows anything about Kitty, she was a pretty monumental presence in his life as a confidant and as a real scientific brain herself. 
And the final actor that shared some details on their character was actually Josh Hartnett, who, if you remember, was once almost cast as Batman in Nolan's Batman Begins. After saying that the film felt intimate, even though it was a big movie with a lot of actors on set, he explained a bit more about his character, Ernest Lawrence, who was a longtime friend of the main character. He said, I knew very little about him before taking on this role, and it's surprising to me that someone who was so instrumental in the choices that were made surrounding both the Manhattan Project and also the Rad Lab and physics within the US generally. For me to have very little familiarity with him as a historical figure was surprising. Lawrence named one of his kids after Oppenheimer and they worked together very closely for a long time and ended up being close colleagues. Nolan ended this segment on characters by concluding that it was a really fun and challenging combination of an incredible ensemble, but the film is so focused on one man's experience and one man's view of the world. Coming now to another element that was discussed in the article, we did actually get an interview with Oppenheimer's special effects supervisor Scott R. Fisher about the challenges of emulating the destruction of the Trinity test without using CGI. He said, It was my sixth film with Chris. Compared to a lot of the other ones we've done, it was definitely not as rigorous with day-to-day -day filming. There's not as much stuff for you on this as the other one, but there's a couple of things we do have to cover. And that was, of course, the Trinity explosion and some prop builds and elements of different things that we had throughout the film. According to the article, both Fisher and Nolan used the method of old-fashioned miniatures but applied them to explosions. The aim was to make them big enough so that they looked real but also small enough so that the camera could be put closer to it. I did actually say in my creating the nuke scene video the other day that I thought they might take an approach involving miniatures and also that I thought the perspective would shift when that bomb goes off to give us closer angles of the explosion. A way of shifting the perspective, if you will, from Oppenheimer's point of view to the audience themselves. And based on what Fisher said here about using bigotures and keeping the camera close, it does sound like it's along the same lines. He said, It is like an old school technique. We don't call them miniatures, we call them bigotures. We do them as big as we possibly can can, but we do reduce the scale so it's manageable. It's getting it closer to the camera and doing it as big as you can in that environment. On discussing the practical ingredients of the scene, he continued by saying, it's mostly gasoline, propane, any of that kind of stuff, because you get so much bang for your buck. But then we also bring in stuff like aluminium powder and magnesium to really enhance the brightness and give it a certain look. We did a bit of that on this because we really wanted everyone to talk about that flash moment and that brightness. So we tried to replicate that as much as we could. Total Film had further spoke with visual effects supervisor Andrew Jackson, who apparently had a lot of experience with filming bombs and explosions. He showed Nolan an explosion demo reel, and the director selected the look of what he wanted from Jackson's visual album. Jackson said, I've been doing this for years. I had years of little samples and things that I filmed. So I put together a single screen with little thumbnails of all these different effects and things that I filmed that I thought were interesting. And I just played that on a big screen and said, is there anything here that you find interesting? On top of visualising the atomic bomb from a visual and practical level, Andrew Jackson also revealed a bit more about some of those trippy visuals that we've already seen in the trailers. According to Nolan, these scientific visuals are actually the visuals that manifest in Oppenheimer's mind surrounding all of the science, and it's a way of putting the audience even more so in Oppenheimer's shoes. He said, yes, we've got to represent the Trinity test, but we also have to represent these images images, these things in Oppenheimer's head. His ability to look into matter and see and feel energy there. The most obvious thing to do would be to do them all with computer graphics, but I knew that that was not going to achieve the sort of tactile, ragged, real nature of what I wanted. And so the goal was, and in the end we have achieved it, to have everything that appears in the film be photographed. And have the computer used for what it's best for, which is compositing, 
and putting ideas together. Speaking of how they ensured the reality of the film and making sure it's believable and historically accurate, Nolan did finish off this section by listing some of the things they did to make that possible. According to him, they recreated Los Alamos at the exact location, they hired real scientists as extras, like I detailed before, they reproduced bomb tests with no CGI, and they filmed inside of Manhattan Project buildings, with one of them being Oppenheimer actual home. It really is extraordinary to hear how they've really kept this as accurate as possible, and while we've seen Nolan focus on reality in all of his previous films, I think this definitely sounds like the furthest that he and his team have gone when it comes to showcasing the reality of this particular history. The whole article then comes to an end, and they leave on a very important note, one which highlights the importance of this film in general. Total Film explains that the danger of the power that Oppenheimer and his team unleashed has never gone away, and that the film's central themes and the main character's turmoil might now feel more relevant than ever, as the threat of nuclear war has been brought back in recent times. Nolan commented on this, saying, I think right now, people are are very very aware of it and thinking about it a lot with the developments in Ukraine but it's something that from Hiroshima on has never gone anywhere as a threat. Emily Blunt added to this by saying, I think it was surreal that that was starting in Russia and Ukraine when we were filming. It was obviously unexpected by Chris and Emma, but yes, very timely. A timely subject matter, a complicated paradoxical protagonist, a gold standard racing thriller. It's an overwhelming experience and I felt like my bones would shatter watching it. And Nolan finished the whole article by quoting, You hope to catch the right moment in time, and that's in the hands of the movie gods. But there should never be a distinction between these things. When you look at Oppenheimer's experience, he's dealing with some of the most tense and paradoxical scenarios that are far beyond anything you can put into fiction. I am actually planning a video on this for my Road to Oppenheimer series, and I'm going to be looking at how Nolan, with the case study of The Dark Knight, makes the right movie at the right time to reflect the themes and questions of a particular period. That will be coming very soon, but yeah, everything they say about the importance of this movie in today's landscape is something that I think will attract a lot of people. We'll have to see, but so far, everything that's been said about the film only adds to my anticipation for it, and I can't wait to see how all of these details are present when we finally see it this July. But they were the main images and details released from the new Total Film edition of Christopher Nolan's Oppenheimer. There is so much to be excited about when it comes to everything that was said here, and hearing how Nolan, Killian, and the cast and crew have gone to extreme measures to capture the real details of this story, it makes me even more fascinated to see how they will translate the American Prometheus book to the big screen. But I'm interested to hear what you guys think towards the new image Images and details, alongside what personally excites you the most about Nolan's upcoming film. So let me know down below in the comment section. For much more videos and news on Christopher Nolan's Oppenheimer, then subscribe to the channel and turn on your notifications. Also, if you enjoyed this video, remember to leave a like rating and follow me on social media via the links in the description. But anyway, I hope you guys enjoyed it. I've been Cortex, and as always, make some noise.